I have walked out on a pool deck <laughs> and oh, been like, scared me. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't go over very well, so I didn't do that again. No, <laughs> I would love to have seen that. <laughs> Excuse me. Welcome to Fit Radio. Slip on your minimal sneakers, notch your headphones into your ears, tuck your smartphone into your pocket, and take us along for a walk while we talk. Or just grab a cup of your favorite drink and get on the floor and stretch a bit while we bring you all things fitness, core, and diastases recti related. You guys ready? Yes. Yep. All right. Born ready. Born ready. I love that. I, I love your first one, though, when you're like, I wish I could just say all those things. <laughs> I know. That is so bad. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome to Fit to Be Radio. My name is Chris Banky, and I'm going to be your host for today. I've got with us uh, Beth Learn. She's the CEO and founder of Fit to Be Studio. Um, and we also have with us a, a cool guest I'm excited to talk about, Kim Ulsterholzer. And we've been talking in the pre-show about your last name, and I'm not sure if I said it right or not. I yeah. practiced. Um, but I'm excited to have you on. Thanks for spending some time with us today. Where are you in the world? It looks like you might be in your bedroom. I'm in my bedroom. Bedroom. Okay. Where in is that Colorado. bedroom? Colorado. Okay. Colorado Springs. Yeah. Colorado Springs. And are you a Colorado native? No, I'm from Michigan. From Michigan. And what I've brought only been you here Colorado? for four years. Four years. Okay. How did you I, end up in Colorado? Um, well, my first husband died in 2007 when my kids were teenagers. And then my kids grew up. And then I met Steve. He's actually also from uh, Michigan, but he's uh, in the army. Well, he retired from the army, but he was stationed here. And then he said, Hey, do you want to get married? And I said to my kids, Hey, what if I get married and move away to Colorado? And they said, right. as long as you come back sometime. So bam, right. I'm here. And there you are. And, how, and <laughs> how do you like it? I really love it. It's so pretty. It's sunny. It's dry, but it's so yeah. sunny. And I realized after about two weeks being here, when you pull out onto the main road and there's Pikes Peak, like yeah, I said, nobody would move back to Michigan for the scenery, really. Right. Yeah. For the weather. I love Colorado Springs. I love, um, I just love that whole area. It was on our short list of places to go. We didn't end up there, but it's, it's really beautiful there. Took the drive to the top of Pikes Peak, saw the signs about being lightheaded in the parking lot, thought that was silly, and then was super <laughs> lightheaded in the parking lot. <laughs> Walking over to the gift shop, it's just so high. That's the is that that's the highest you can drive, right, in the states? I don't know. I can't remember for sure, but we climbed it last year. Oh my so goodness! Fun. It that's took um, it took us two days because I have this, you know, my breathing is not like ideal, but yeah, yeah, we climbed up right up to the top. That was wow. kind of fun. Nice I job. Mean, that was, now every time I look at it, I say. Look at that. I climbed to the top of that. Yeah. That's a, that's a good feeling. That is yeah. amazing. Yeah. Well, so Kim, you are a midwife, which is really cool, mm -hmm. but you're a midwife that um, serves Amish people. So that's correct, right? Yes. I, my, the Amish communities I served are in Michigan. So when okay. I moved out here, my daughter's also a midwife. I turned my practice over to her. Okay. And um, anytime I'm home, I do. I still do births there, but in Colorado, my um, clients are English. Yeah, got it. That's very interesting. I'm excited to learn more about that. How did you and Beth meet? You guys Wait, okay. Wait, oh, Beth. Beth <laughs> I Beth, have the book. If you're listening to the podcast, not watching this, Beth is holding up a book right now. Can you tell us about that? Yes, this is, this is the book that Kim wrote, and I was one of the lucky few to get an advanced copy that is bigger than the actual copy um, and i got this nice little note from her um so that i could review it okay so what and, so what's the book for the people that are only oh listening? sorry it's a midwife in amish country and it is her memoirs um of and so many cool birth stories oh it's beautiful such a good book get your hands on it yeah and and now kim now you can tell them how you met me <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, I've been, you know, serving moms, pregnant moms, birthing moms since 1993. And that, that was, you know, my, um, apprenticeship. And I also had two babies at home in the early nineties. 
And of course, at the end of having my son, I had a two to three finger breadth diastasis recti. And my midwife said, I said, what do we do about this crazy thing going on in my belly? And she said, basically, it's just what happens to moms when they have babies. And, you know, if you want plastic surgery, you can fix mm -hmm. it. And that's all we knew then. Wow. And, um, and then, of course, I had like a, you know, like that uh, sacro iliac joint discomfort and like the week back it was like everything and then you know sneeze and pee all that yeah you know, i enjoyed all the mm -hmm. things that you know <laughs> we enjoy enjoy uh, words of birth <laughs> and um and it was just like yeah this is the price you pay so lucky you and that never really set very well with me um because i just don't believe like i do believe god made our amazing bodies to birth but i also believe like that it's not supposed to cost us our vitality. Mm. And so it was one of those things that, you know, as you're serving moms and they're telling you about their aches and pains, it was, it was like the thing that I always went away from visits heavy hearted about because I didn't know what to say. Right. And um, I did go to a conference in Michigan in early, um, somewhere, somewhere around the time, like 2007, 2008, I think. Mm -hmm. And a physical therapist um, had a whole bunch of ideas about how to handle some of these issues. And I brought my friend who's a physical therapist too, and may, I made her come. And um, long story short, we started having some solutions or things we could say, you know, like this is what you can do for your sacroiliac joint. Here's some ideas to start getting your diastasis recti closed and things like that. And then, but we still... You know, it was like we, we felt encouraged because we were on the way toward getting people into a better place. Right. But then I had a, a client, and it was interesting because she had her fourth baby, and she's one of these really slim moms, so she looks mm -hmm. great. At the six-week visit, you know, I, we evaluated her belly, and she didn't have a DR at all. And so we said, wow, yay, you know, you're like, fine. But she couldn't. Um, reach in, like if she reached down to pick up the baby, her, her back was really weak. And she was like, mm -hmm. I can barely pick this baby up. And she said, what do you think of that? And I said, gosh, that's terrible. <laughs> you know, I, just, <laughs> I don't have no clue. Mm. And she is a researcher. And so she started doing some um, research online and she found you. Oh. And, and she tried the um, transverse abdomen, like the totally transverse. Mm -hmm. And she did it for like, and she measured herself before, even though she was like minute. Yeah. And then she, um, she did it for like five days in a row and she like trimmed off an inch or something or maybe two. And her back was like, within that week was so much stronger. And she wow. said, Kim, you got to check this woman out. And uh, so I, you know, got online. We had terrible internet at the time, but I got online and my daughter who, you know, she wasn't married and didn't have her kids yet. Um, but we got on, we, but she also had a two finger breath DR, even though she, mm -hmm. had, had yeah, because it can happen right. even if you have not had kids because right. it's not caused right. by pregnancy, it's caused by pressure. Yep, yeah. So we were like, what in the world? And uh, so we got, we got found you and we did the total. We, so we struggled through the total. You see, it looks so simple when you watch it, it is, it's deceptively. It, Deceiving. <laughs> yes, it's definitely deceiving. It's definitely. So we were, <laughs> excuse me, we were like, oh my gosh, we're, we finally figured out, like, you have to get the breathing with the movement. That's the trickiest part. Yep. And so um, we finally managed. It's a 10 minute video, it took us about an hour, I think. <laughs> and, then, um, and then we were sore for several days. <laughs> and then we said, I said, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And so, like, I, um, I basically, from then on, I just followed Beth and I forced her to be my friend over time. And, <laughs> you know, and then my, you know, the interesting thing is, though, you know, two thirds of my clients in Michigan are Amish and they couldn't, they can't get online to do an online program. Right. So Hannah and I just spent like forever and we still do it, you know, like, oh, this is what we, we'd have these little conferences sometimes where we, all the, all the Amish moms would meet in somebody's barn and we would teach them how to do your routines. Mm -hmm. and, we, I'm, and I'm sorry, we wrote it all down because <laughs> we had to. It was That's like, okay. you know, so we wrote it all down. We gave you credit though. We always like, thank you. you. Yeah. So and, that, so that when those Amish ladies go online, 
No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> like, never. <laughs> but it was amazing because um, one of the moms, we do you mind me? I'm just keep rambling on about Go this. Go for it. This is amazing. No, I love it. So there was a mom I served. Um, she, she was Amish, and I got her. She, she switched to me. I think when she was having her fifth baby and this was about maybe a year and a half before I discovered you. Mm -hmm. Um, and probably, I think we did the conference and met you like found you online about the same time period because they, they just were, you know, first of all, it was kind of a fire hose of information. So we were overwhelmed, but, um, but we learned a lot. And then our visits, all of our prenatal visits and postpartum visits became like, twice as long because you know you're trying to explain to everybody yeah how to do everything um and we're all laughing because we can't figure out the breathing even though we teach it like you know five times a day but um so this mom was having her fifth and she switched to me from another midwife and she warned me ahead of time yeah i have really fast birth so when i go into labor you have to come immediately Mm. and i said okay so she called and um hannah and i flew on down there and I could see her contraction pattern was really irregular and uh, she wanted me to check her and she was five centimeters. Mm. And um, so she wasn't going as fast as she, so she wasn't. Going to, no. Yeah. And, um, and then the contraction pattern was irregular. And I did say, well, you know, this is what I see as women get older and have more babies. It's like almost like their bodies go, what we're not doing this again you know we're <laughs> at it and and you you kind of have to sweet talk it into clicking into gear but um I remember saying you know well why don't you get in the tub for a while and let's see you know and I wasn't that worried about it being irregular because I knew it would kick in mm-hmm. but she got in the tub and after about 20 minutes I could hear her crying so I thought okay better do something and I um had her get out put her on the birth stool and I checked her she wanted to be checked again. And I checked her and it was like, oh my gosh, she's five centimeters still. And I didn't, mm. she said, what is it? And I said, just a second. And I, you know, I basically swept my finger around a couple times and, and she just, every time I swept my finger around, it would, she would dilate another centimeter. Huh. And she started to get a contraction when she was like nine centimeters. And I said, why don't you just give a little push? And I handed her a baby and she went to bed, stopped, stopped crying, went to bed. <laughs> but the thing is, is like, that's really dysfunctional. Mm-hmm. And, and so even though it was like, that's awesome that we, you know, were able to go from five to 10 that fast, blah, blah, blah. But it was just a dysfunctional labor. And I, so after she had the baby, um, and when she was like five, six weeks, I think by the time she was six weeks postpartum, we had learned enough about like how to, how to find a DR. Mm-hmm. She had a five finger breath DR. Yeah. And I said, I wow. think this is what happened. I think this is part of what's happening, you know? And so about three or four, maybe half a year later, cause I, okay, it must've been like six to nine months later, my friend who's a physical therapist, we, we did a, one of these little, like gathered all these Amish ladies into one room, taught them everything we knew. And then my friend went ahead and we had this curtained off area and she just evaluated everybody's belly and said, this is how many finger breaths, you know, this is how many you are in the yard. And, and here's our suggestions. Yeah. And so this mom came to that. And um, I think this is when we realized she was five. I don't think I knew how to check at her six weeks. Okay. She was, so, but she was already pregnant again. Oh. And she was, and we said, wow, you're five. And we, and I remember thinking we're just looking at another dysfunctional labor. And, um, but Clarissa gave her a lot of suggestions and we had her start doing the totally transverse um, routine. And by the time, so we didn't know, of course, when, when you're nine months pregnant, you don't really know how the, how broad the DR is. I mean, I, I didn't even, didn't even cross my mind to check, but she was definitely having fewer complaints. And, um, she had a beautiful labor. I mean, we almost missed it. It was like three hours, just like before and postpartum. Um, so this was her sixth baby and postpartum at the six week visit, she was only two finger breaths with it. Oh, only, wow. had only had it. So there it is. Is. after the whole pregnancy, you know, and really all she did was the, was the totally transverse mm-hmm. and squatting. Mm-hmm. And, um, so that was, that was when we really said, wow, this is definitely wow. 
That yeah. was probably when I said, Beth is going to be my friend. I will. <laughs> she will love me. <laughs> and I so. do. Anybody, anybody who does birth, but um, especially, especially the way that you approach it um, is so refreshing. And I, I love that you took what you knew and, and shared it. I mean, this information is information that every woman should have. Every midwife should have. Absolutely. Yeah. And the fact that they don't, that the knowledge has been so lost and mm-hmm. so jumbled uh, yeah. is, is a tragedy. And I'm not the only one sharing the information. Um, but, you know, I'm just the one that you found. Yes. And you have a really nice um, down-to-earth fun way of addressing it and that is at least it's relatable for me and my clients all my i mean my clients love the clients who can get online they love you and appreciate you oh thanks well i appreciate hearing that (laughs) how is it trying to get um amish women to do like a fitness routine i mean that's challenging (laughs) (laughs) yeah but you figured out how right i mean it sounds like obviously this this woman did what you said and practiced it and she must have done it pretty, you know, she consistently and strictly diligent. Well, and the reason why I giggle is because these are already strong women. These women are, they're already yeah. doing a lot. They're living yeah. pretty active lives. Yeah. I imagine that they're one of their first thoughts is, lady, I'm already going without electricity. I'm already, <laughs> you know, and you want me to do what with my body? It's more like I have six children. I get up at three o'clock in the morning. Oof. You know, I, I, yeah, I don't go to bed till I'm, ex- you know, till should they drop into bed exhausted. They, yeah. they work. That's the thing. They, they aren't strong in the sense that, um, like if you just work really hard, but you don't actually take care of yourself. Mm. You know, it's, it's amazing mm. what your mind can force you to do when you have to do it, but they're, they're not as strong as they should be, need to be, etc. You know, if they're having babies, like, like these women, this is one thing I really discovered. After we discovered my own daughter had a DR, then I started noticing that my first time Amish moms, almost without exception, came to, the, to care with pretty significant DRs. And I think so before they even had their babies? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and you really have to wonder, I have all kinds of little interesting theories about it, but one thing I know for sure is if you have a 10-year-old girl hauling a five-gallon bucket of water across a barn, that's a lot of right. pressure. That's a lot of, you're just asking for, for dysfunction. Yeah. Like women. And of course, they're not stopping and training that motion. It's no. not like they're teaching a kettlebell carry, you know? Right, <laughs> right. 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 Like it doesn't occur to them, like, go ahead and tighten everything up before you lift the load. Which, when my kids were little, I did have some instinctual understanding of this stuff. We, we heated our house with firewood. And we did, so we did a lot of, like, stuff with firewood, which is heavy. And I would say to them, all right, you're going to pick this. You know, we're going to be picking up all these logs. You know, tighten your bottom and tighten your tummy. And I remember my son was like... Please don't say tighten your bottom, you know? <laughs> My friend was coming to that, that works. Please don't say tighten your bottom. I said, hun, we're going to do what we have to do to not get hernias. So yep. anyway, but that was one thing was realizing these women are coming. So you can work really, really hard. Or it's like a roofer that spends his whole life working, you know, on right. roofs. He's strong in, in his can work long hours, but that doesn't mean he hasn't like debilitated his body while he's at it. Yeah. Right. You know, and that's exactly what we're seeing. Yeah. So the yeah. Amish women, when, you know, when you say, like I would say, so how, you know, I had this little checklist of things I ask. like, it's literally on like, are you doing your transverse abdominis? Are you doing your inversion? I have like, oh, that's so from, good. Have you seen the chiropractor? Are you drinking your water? Like this whole long list mm-hmm. of things we I, i'm the professional nagger basically and and <laughs> you'll say it. have you exercised <clears throat> are, are you doing any regular exercise and they're just like hello like yeah i'm hauling buckets of water and i wash the laundry by hand and you're <laughs> like that i know you're working hard but that's not the same thing mm-hmm. no there's a difference between wear and tear yeah. and rebuilding yes exactly but from a exactly. cultural standpoint like doing something physical Mm-hmm. for no functional reason right. is it's, just crazy. It is Got crazy. It. 
-hmm. and they don't understand and that's the thing I've really tried to you know take the time to explain to them too it's like if you will take the time to create strength Mm -hmm. real strength and health like you know make we also look at what they eat then you actually will have more energy to do your work Mm -hmm. and your body will handle the work you do better and then when you're you know, we like when I say, "Hey, are you doing these exercises?" And they're like, "I don't have time," and and I, and I just remind them that you, if you want your bladder to stay in the right place in your uterus when you're fifty, like this is about keeping your organs right where they belong, and then they know that, and then they know that because their their moms. I mean, I can't tell you how many Amish moms. I'd go see a mom, and she'd say, "Hey, could you stop over to my mother's house?" Because she thinks something's falling out. So mm-hmm. we go and like look this mom over and it's like, yeah, sure enough, it's, there's your yeah. start, you know. Or, do you, do you ever, I don't know if this is within your scope. Do you ever fit moms for pessaries at that point? No, what do, what do you offer part. them at that point? Um, I, I usually would bring my um, friend Clarissa down. Poor Clarissa. I just dragged her all over creation. <laughs> like, are you dizzy on Thursday? And just bring her down. But you know, a lot of times, um, so then those moms that actually have something falling out or, you know, fecal incontinence or something yeah. that's like dramatic, you know, dramatic, then yeah. um, we would try to get them regular visits with Clarissa because she took, she's a physical therapist and she took, um, oh, Bruce Lebrecht is the physical therapist in Michigan. Okay. Who he came up with a program like, you if you don't know him like you guys would love each other. So he um, he has a an advanced program for physical therapists who want to work like exclusively with women and their issues. Mm-hmm. So she after I dragged her to his class, it was a midwifery conference and I brought her, and then she went and took his course. Yeah, and so um, that was amazing. But some of the moms again, it's like wow, your uterus is falling out. You should really like not do the heavy lifting in the barn anymore for, you know, like let's get you fixed. And I was like, that's not, that's not happening. I'm going to, I have to do my. Right. So, but we tried, did our best. What what I'm hearing too is that, um, I don't like calling them excuses. Uh, I just like that, that cheapens it because they are valid reasons. Mm Mm-hmm. Whether you're Amish or English or whatever, yeah. your reasons for avoiding doing this stuff are similar. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's it's avoidance of self care. Mm-hmm. So I think sometimes it's. Um, so you guys tell me if this is true. There's a there's a certain amount of avoidance that everyone has to doing physical exercise most of the time, unless they're like Beth and crazy and really really do want to go like lift weights or something for real. <laughs> most and you, people Tim likes yes, to do. Most people avoid. Um, but then there's a different kind of avoidance. That's the avoidance of the self care because I need to put myself last. I yeah. need to be serving. There's mm-hmm. that angle. Mm-hmm. And that I feel like is far more powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, is that assumption true? Yes, it's it's almost like the self care is frivol is frivolous. Right. That's what I see. Like, mm. and I think that's what you're saying. Yes. And um, and moms are like notorious for that. And then I think if you if the Amish moms are even beyond that because, you know, they there's nothing they do in their lives that's uh, for aesthetics. Like they're not gonna. They, it's interesting because they're, they're pretty normal women like the rest of us. They, if they're chubby, if they're what, you know, no, none of us women are that comfortable with how we look <laughs> because right. of our culture. It's like mm-hmm. you know, even the Amish are, you know, they don't want to be chubby or they don't like whatever their definition of they can think you look great, but they don't think they look great. But to do a exercise program to change the way you look, you know, and that's how exercise is sometimes perceived. Yeah. Right. Exercise to look better. Well, that's how most of it is sold. Right. Most ex- exactly. Not us, which actually right. makes it hard for us to right. sell ourselves. It actually <laughs> is a challenge we're always facing in yeah. our marketing discussions. Um, but, but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> and that's the thing too. It's like what I try to explain to moms is like, so if you were to, if you're to exercise properly and eat properly, the, the gain is your health. And the side effect is, yeah, you'll look better, but 
who cares of what you look like if you're non-functional at 40 years old, you know, or you have to go get your bladder tacked back into place or, uh, you know, the crazy things you hear about. So the Amish moms that really embrace um, like your program and, mm -hmm. and that diligent exercise, they're the moms that, you know, are like, wow, I just had the most horrible birth mm -hmm. I've ever had. And, um, I can't do this again five more times. Right. Yeah. yeah. yeah we, get, <coughs> we get a lot of, um, of moms that have had several children who want to have several more. Yeah. Right. Super defeated and betrayed by their own bodies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, and don't you think like, I know I, after birth, I put moms in a, like once they're up, go to the bathroom, come back to bed, I put them in a binder. Mm -hmm. the um, tummy team binders yeah and um and then i just say for the first six weeks you know 24 7 be in your binder mm -hmm. and, um, and then we evaluate their belly evaluate their bottom and then make recommendations from there um but it's interesting too how we talk about feeling defeated i think there's mm -hmm. even if your belly is not like if you have a serious dr i think it i don't know like it does I think it has a psychological, there's some kind of a psychological, you're more prone to depression. Yes. And I don't think it's just because of how you look or how you feel about something else is going on. Yeah. yeah. I haven't seen, and I, I wish somebody would, hey, maybe you and I could get our heads together, Kim. <laughs> yeah. Like research the incidence of depression. I mean, maybe it would be as simple as running a survey. If they've been diagnosed with diastases mm -hmm. and if they've also been diagnosed with depression and mm -hmm. what's the correlation there? I mean, I don't think, I don't know if it's causation, but I think the two can definitely go hand in hand mm -hmm. and it's not just because of aesthetics, mm -hmm. but because well, our mid centers do so much for us. Well, it makes perfect sense. If you, if you kind of step back and look at it as you are your body, you can't really be disconnected from it. And mm -hmm. when you are faced with that realization that, Hey, this is broken. Mm -hmm. And it's not from doing some wild living or something like it's broken right. through natural, a natural situation. Then it feels like you're flawed. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So then yeah. that's, that's, then you have this kind of, well, I guess I'm flawed. So yeah. that sucks. Now and that kind of feeling like your body has betrayed you. Right. Yeah. And that motherhood has betrayed you. But that's the thing too. They say that, that by wearing your binder diminishes postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. Like, so there has to be some, there has to be like, mm -hmm. like you're getting a hug all day or something. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, Kelly has said that she's gone on record. Oh, really? okay. yeah, she's done a couple of case studies. Oh. Um, and, um, I, I believe it seems like I did see a study that was done. It was just a small one where they used binders in as part of the protocol. Mm -hmm. along along with medication it seems mm -hmm. like but i i can't speak um coherently on that so let's just set that aside for right now but i mean if they haven't <laughs> done that be they should the needs yeah. Be yeah you know yeah. along those same lines do you think that there's more of a stigma um in the amish community in these more conservative communities in general, when it comes to a mom who feels like she can't have more kids and what that does to her mentality? Um, well, let's see. It's really challenging in the Amish community because if, if a woman, you know, you will, you will, if you serve one woman through the course of her childbearing years, each one of these women have this point where we both realize, even if she doesn't quite vocalize it, that she's not, She's hoping that somehow she doesn't get pregnant again mm -hmm. very soon or at all. And um, that's challenging because any kind of birth control, even a lot of them even feel like just abstaining from sex to not get pregnant is a sin. Mm -hmm. So it's not like that's, I feel like that goes so far beyond a stigma. It's like it's considered sinful. And mm -hmm. um, so that's, that is a, it's a huge um they just really struggle with that. Right. And then they also struggle with feeling guilty for not wanting more children. But then they, if they get pregnant, it's just interesting because then if they get, they do love their babies. I think yeah. they wouldn't mind having 12 kids if maybe they didn't have to give birth to all of them. 
right. you know, <laughs> or because, and it's, and it's really birth. I mean, birth is challenging, but, um, but I think it's also the, the wear and tear on their bodies. Mm-hmm. You know, they just kind of age quickly. You know? Yeah. Well, and they're working so hard. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I think we, I think we have a perception from the outside looking in that they just crank them out easy peasy. And, and they just, and they're just strong and they just, this is just what they do and it's just easy and, and they just love it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's not, um, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, as, as I was reading your book, I was like, Oh yeah, this, this is very insightful. And it plays into that psychosomatic, the mind body. Um, like Chris said, we can't just divorce ourselves from our body bodies you know i believe we are soul spirit living inside of this physical shell but Mm -hmm. but they're connected and and there's this hesitancy i don't know if you've encountered this kim in the physical therapy and midwifery world this hesitancy to use the word broken right now and i wrote a blog about it like why i don't have a problem with the word broken why i don't think Mm -hmm. we should ban that word because like you know let's not use avoidance speech let's not use terminal speech let's not use condemning speech Mm. Um, you know, let's, you know, and I get it because they don't, we, let's not use the word can't, let's not use the word avoid. Um, let's not use the word broken. Let's discourage our clients from using those words. And I'm not sure I'm on that side of the fence. Mm. Um, because I think we need to be clear. And, and as I pointed out in my blog, um, when I was a kid growing up in a family where my dad could fix anything, if something was broken, that wasn't a sense of damnation it wasn't the end of the world it was you you bring it you bring the pieces to daddy and say it's broken and that's the moment you get help Mm -hmm. the moment that you say this is broken it's Mm -hmm. i need help i need it needs to be fixed i need duct tape i need screws i need (laughs) something i think the difference is um the difference is when you have something broken and you spring it to someone and they say let's fix this and the difference of you know, a woman coming to a doctor and they're like, yeah, that's just, that's how it is. It's a bummer. Yeah. That's a big difference. And then, then then you don't want to use the word broken if that's the mentality. Cause then it's like, I don't want to be broken my whole life. It's more Mm -hmm. of an acceptance, but the problem is that that's wrong. Yeah. That's where the real problem is. In this case. Yeah. I haven't really thought of it in terms of um, like words necessarily, because I, I don't, I don't know. I'm, when women are talking to me about their bodies, I don't think either of us are trying to like, it's like, what's going on with your body? This is what's going on with the body. This is how let's, let's do this and this and this and see if we can achieve a repair and re, you know, rejuvenation. And yeah, in that moment, you're not trying to censor yourself or say the right words. You're just trying to get, right. the, get to the bottom of it. Literally. <laughs> Yes, literally. <laughs> and I don't know. I'm not, I guess maybe I've never, I haven't heard the whole like terminology argument. Um, sometimes I think I'm just so busy doing what I'm doing that, you know, I'm just doing what I do. Yeah. But, um, which is great. I'm not necessarily, that's the thing is I'm, I'm not necessarily, what I, I'm not necessarily afraid of, of the fact that something is broken, like you said. And I did have also had a dad who was a serious fixer. So yeah. maybe there's like, it did like set me on the right, with the right mentality about right. it. Mm-hmm. But when somebody said, like, I remember when my midwife said, well, you're, you just have a two finger, you know, two to three finger breath DR. And unless you want surgery. And I remember thinking, so I was probably 25. <laughs> I thought, well, okay, I'm not going to get surgery, but I'm, I'm going, if, if the, if this, if these muscles aren't, stuck together like they're supposed to be i'm going to train them to lay near each other so that at least we'll just so i started doing by myself i mean i just started like i'd hold it to hold it together and do like little crunches and Mm -hmm. i did that three times a week for 16 years and then i went to that um, class with the physical therapist and um he was talking about how here's how to find your dr of course all these midwives are sprawled across the floor we're all feeling their bellies (laughs) And I was like, I know, okay, I haven't even checked. I never did recheck. I just said, well, we'll just get it where, put everything where I want it, and we'll strengthen it there, not knowing anything, obviously. Yeah, and which we is by. part of it. Yeah. And I, have, I don't have a DR at all. And mm-hmm. I was like, 
Well, and I was able, it was kind of neat to be sitting there and go, hey, this actually, yeah, you can fix it. Yeah. This is cool. And um, I mean, after I had my kids, you know, I, I wet myself. I mean, it's interesting to be almost 50 years old and to have a uh, core and a floor that is better than almost any other woman I know, just because I've followed these little principles for, you know, some of way before I knew what they were. And then once I met you and went to these classes and learned the actual terminology and actual, right. this is how you actually do it. And it wasn't even me just sort of trying to make it better on my own. You yeah. can really, you, and so I know for sure you can be functional. And I think that is one thing that worked with my Amish clients when, you know, they, their moms and I are, we're the same age and they would, and it, and I could say, nobody had to say, do you want what your mom has or do you want what I have? But one of those things, you don't have to say it, right. yeah. you know, they just look at me and, and I say, you can fix yourself. Yeah. We can do this. Yeah. yeah. If you will set the time aside and then, um, some moms prioritize it and some didn't. Now you've, um, you've also picked my brain in the past about, yeah. uh, lifting weights because <laughs> you're, yeah. you do CrossFit and, um, you work out at a box and they, they, they asked you to lead something because yeah. you were, so then, I called you. Stuff. <laughs> then she calls me and she's like, well, yeah. how did that conversation go? I said, I'm about to teach this class. You should come and teach it. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, <laughs> but you can't come. I think I just had some questions and like had some thoughts and ideas. Yeah. and wanted to make sure they were valid, like that. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. So the, yeah, I remember you asking me about you know some of the breathing with different things, and yeah. you talked about like deadlifts because the breathing with that can get tricky because there's so many complex moves, especially yeah. if you get into clean and presses. Yeah, and so we just like had this phone session. And it was so good. I do want to come visit. Yes, I would love to have you at, with our in our midwifery community. The midwifery community is a little there's things going on in it right now, but once things settle down a little bit, mm -hmm. I think it would be great to have you come and speak. Okay. I would love that. Let's set it up. So yeah. <laughs> do you feel like in the community there's more and more awareness for this in the midwifery community, or is oh, yeah. it still resistant there too? Um, if there's any resistance, it's it, I don't really think it would be so much resistance. What I see more than anything, like this is what happens with midwives. We are interested in learning and in improving the care we provide our clients. Like that, that kind of is midwifery in a, in a sense, like let's, let's make this the best it possibly can be. Right. And then of course you get really busy with all your clients mm -hmm. and your family. And you're just really excited if you got a shower and brushed your teeth and food today you know sometimes right. so talk about self-care you know you really have to be intentional in that department so sometimes when you say hey here's a whole other venue of learning here people can be like i'm exhausted i'm going to bed you know what? but we we I'm see, done. Hmm? yeah i'm done <laughs> and, but then it's it's uh, like we just keep talking about it, and and that's one thing I love about midwifery too. Is we'll all get together in conferences, we get together in peer review groups, and get together and talk about what we're learning, what we're doing with our clients, and sharing information. And so the more we share, so when, once I learned, um, once I went through, I had taken what I learned at, about the transverse abdominis and made it into something that we could use with the Amish ladies. Um, just that little. A uh, couple pages, mm -hmm. and uh, there was two other midwives in the area that served the Amish. One of them it was my preceptor, and the other one is like one of my heroes. She's done like twenty five hundred births. She's amazing. Wow. And we all got together in, in Sue's kitchen, and like they were like, "Tell us what you've learned." And so we went and brought the papers and said, "This is what we're learning," and um, what we're learning. That was the thing is not like what we've learned and we've got it but yeah right. so then I know they're you know taking everyone takes the information and dispel you know disseminates it in their own mm -hmm. way but yeah you know it's the benefit well, what would you say the benefit is to midwives to have this information about the core and pelvic floor and yeah. how those muscles actually work how to bring those muscles back online how to integrate 
the core and pelvic floor in birth, how to be able to bring that into some of your mm -hmm. support methods? Like what's the benefit to, to you? Oh, it's super easy. I mean, it's the same, re it's the same as with a chiropractic care. Like, it, like I, yes, for your sake as my client, I want you to have, you know, your everything to function properly. Mm -hmm. And what the, the reason I want it to is the same reason you would want it to. It's like, do you want a quicker, easier, less painful birth? You know, oh, how about repair? How about recovery? Do you want a quick, easy recovery? Like, how, <laughs> how you know, do you want it hard or easy? It's like super simple. Yeah. So, you know, if you have a mom, like that's the thing you have, like they, we were really lucky with that mom who stayed at five centimeters for a while and I was able to get her on the birth stool and, you know, sweep her cervix open. Um, you know, we've been with other moms. I had a mom several years ago that we, she had, she was having her sixth or seventh. I think it was her seventh. Mm. And um, we, she was, her core and floor was, and this is well before, this was well before we learned about um, any of the repair, any of this mm -hmm. um, core rehabilitation. So I remember meeting her, like she's super cute and she's like, looks really, looks really good. But I, the first time I met her, she, I thought she had told me she was 12 weeks pregnant. And, and so I showed up at the door and she looked like six months pregnant, which of course I did not say that, but I yeah. just thought, Oh, she, I must have misunderstood what she said about her dates. And then we sat down and I started asking questions. It's like, no, she's 12 weeks. And then she laid down on the floor and I felt her uterus and her uterus was definitely 12 weeks, <laughs> you know, yeah. uterus. And it was just like, but her, her, I don't, I don't know what her DR would have been. I, I didn't yeah, know to check it. In. But it was, it was pretty wide. It was just like, there was like no support. So then she wound up with a pendulous belly when she was nine months pregnant. And then mm -hmm. she, you know, so she didn't have her abdomen holding her baby up and in the way you're right. supposed to. So pressure on the cervix the way it's supposed to. Exactly. So enough stimulation to really get her body to kick into labor. So she did this like labor pattern that was, enough to annoy her, not enough to start her labor, um, for, oh, I don't know, five days. I mean, I wow. think we were over like, and she couldn't quite get sleep at night. And, but it was That's like five, 10 minute apart contractions that, and finally I said, I think we got to go in. I think you just ran up to do a little bit of Pitocin. And we went in and, um, I called ahead just to say we were coming and it was a grand mal tip and this is what's going on. And they gave her a little bit of Pitocin and 40 minutes later, the baby's out. But that's the thing. It's like, I know what, what I've learned since is like, if, if she had the core and floor she needed, mm -hmm. you know, or if you could have splinted her during that time or right. done some, which I do or, think we tried. Yeah. I, do oh, wow. think we, I think I put her in a binder because it was yeah. like, we did understand that the belly needed to come up and in. Yeah. But, but it I, wasn't had another, I had an oh, Amish no. mom having a 10, her 10th baby that um, we actually used the binder to bring the baby down. Mm -hmm. just, like we had, she had to keep it on. She wouldn't go into labor. And so we experimented with it, put the binder across the top of her belly. And then we stayed for a while and uh, monitored the heart tones and had to do kick counts. She finally went into labor and she had to keep that binder on until she was like seven or eight centimeters. Wow. So, so you just, you know. Yeah, because the transverse abdominis, when it's not functional, the splint can kind of stand in. It does stand in. Yeah. But the uterus knows it's not the same. Yeah. It's not the same kind of pressure. Yeah. And, and so we do our best with these man-made things. But the ideal is that the core be made functional again. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and that's what we're really trying to do here is, yeah. is teach women how to exercise their mm. core muscles con mm. it's really more about connecting with them yeah. and being in control of them yeah. um and lately i feel like those words resonate really well with the crowd that is um not wanting to quote unquote exercise so it's like, okay you know what? let's connect let's just get you to connect with your core oh so that's so interesting well, what's happening. Definitely, i definitely um that that is definitely true mm -hmm. yeah where like so, like the yeah that's and it's interesting one thing i've discovered with moms too you know that that's so interesting is touching like if you touch mm -hmm. i i tell moms when you're doing your transverse abdominis you know touch it because it somehow connects you yes with and then i had a mom who came to me um late care this year 
and she had had a second degree tear with her first baby that went mm -hmm. unrepaired. Oof. And um, she was complaining about her, um, you know, nether parts. And I said, well, do you, can I just assess your vagina? Mm -hmm. And so um, I just did an assessment and I went, you know, went around to about here. Uh -huh. I could feel a gap, something of a gap. But I, when I had her try to do a Kegel, nothing happened. And, and I was thinking, I'm going to send her to the physical therapist. But as I was even thinking that, I said, do you mind if I just stroke your vagina some? And she said, mm -hmm. that's fine. So I just took my fingers and just drew them down. And I said, while I'm doing this, see if you can focus on doing a Kegel. Mm -hmm. And it was like, she immediately did one. Yeah. Was, and, I, and that got me thinking. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I've used that a lot since then. Yeah. I said, you know, put your own fingers in there and touch and mm -hmm. you know, reconnect. But we use that too with women catching their babies. That if um, a woman, that you want her to, to birth her baby gently so that she doesn't have a bad tear, yeah. if you have her put her own hands on her bottom while that head is coming out, it's amazing how she immediately, like, governs, recalibrates, and, like, will change how she's pushing, mm -hmm. and, um, and then she makes it work, and then out come these babies with, like, minimal damage to their perineums. I just read a couple days ago a study that showed, um, and I don't know how they did this, I don't know how they checked it, um, but when the perineum is relaxed, mm -hmm. there, I, think, I think it was like 50% less tearing as opposed to when, the, when everything is tense and tight. But, yeah. Hello, you, you try to push right. something through. <laughs> right, and you have to be intentional about that. So one of the people on my launch team um, is as a physical therapist for yeah. yeah, for my book. And her name is Jen Stone. And she, and she um, said that she developed this like pushing protocol. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, tell me it, you know. So she sent it to me. And, and one of the things she has moms do is while they're pooping is to practice mm -hmm. yep. really relaxing the perineum. And yeah. she says like huff like you're going to fog up a mirror and, and like get the muscle memory, like the so that once you're in labor, you don't have to say, well, how was I supposed to do this? But you do it every time you poop. And um, mm -hmm. I re I've been having moms do that. Well, and that was the thing I was realizing, too, is that when we talk about not pushing too hard, um, some of the moms were so worried that they would push too hard that they, they told me later, they said, I think I was tensing my bottom to try to slow it down. Mm -hmm. so we, you know, we're, 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 this is one thing I'll say is we're constantly learning. Mm -hmm. as we go mm -hmm. and I learn a lot from serving my clients and a lot from listening to my clients but um I really love that um where Jen has this at uh, this really specific way to train your bottom your perineum to relax while you're giving birth and it's making a big difference and she's seen a lot of um good results in her own practice mm -hmm. and she just had a baby and it, I'm pretty sure it went well, <laughs> it's out. It looks like yeah. a beautiful baby. <laughs> and it yeah. was big, too. Like, I think close to 10 pounds. Or wow. Wow. Well, I mean, birth is birth. And, and you and I both know that we can, we can do all the right things and still have baby do something completely different. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I have a dear friend who is a physical therapist who did all the right things. Mm. But then baby got head hyperextended. Ah. Oh. That's, yeah. And they had to see section because uh, just flat out got stuck. Yeah. And um, yeah. big old, big old tailbone bruise right on yeah. the baby's head because it was just jammed yeah. in there. You know, it's, it's, it's a symphony and everybody has to play their part. All the muscles, the baby has to play its part. And yeah. um, oh, I, this is why I nerd out on birth because it's just so yeah. fascinating to me. And I, I think it's so great how you talked about your own hands-on stuff you can do. And I, I wish more midwives would develop that scope of their practice because they already have a license to touch. Mm -hmm. They already can get in there. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we interviewed Jacob Mears, who's a male midwife, and he talked about how he does things like that in his clinic where there are certain things he can do with them. He's like, instead of having a 20 minute appointment, have a 45 minute appointment. And he goes, if they're yeah. reporting things, I get in their exam. He goes, and he'll do some scar massage and he'll oh, do I've been teaching release stuff. Scar massage. 
Yeah, it's huge. And it's so, amazing. especially in smaller communities where mm-hmm. your clients may not have easy access right. to physical therapists mm-hmm. or to good doctors who know what they're saying and aren't just referring them for needless surgeries right. that is body trauma on its own. Yeah. Um, you know, you guys are really that, that front line that's right there. You're already looking at it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And they've already, like, they've already given you the permission and trust you mm-hmm. to yeah. touch. I mean, and we still, like, anytime I do anything, touch moms and ch- touch always anywhere. Ask. It's like you're getting always permission. But, um, but yeah, it, it is interesting to, that's, that's why I thought I should send this mom to the physical therapist. But I said, do you mind if I try something? Yeah. You know, and, and to have it work that quickly. And then I just said, you and your husband, why don't you do that every day? And then, yeah. you know, it was really... I'm sure he won't mind. Very different. <laughs> like I could barely feel that gap later. Which so technically, if you have a second degree tear that goes into the musculature and you don't repair it, like yeah. they say that because that's you know the elasticity of the muscle that it can't just go back together. No, it, but, when um, it, when there's that full avulsion of the levator ani muscle ani ani, it gets pronounced different ways, mm-hmm. um, and it actually is very similar to a common sports injuries that women get. You know, if, if they um, tear or land on their, their crotch wrong when they're doing mm-hmm. sports, mm-hmm. Oh, wow. here's the real tragedy is if they're an athlete and that happens and then they're having trouble and they're having trouble peeing their pants and then, then they're referred to an MRI and then it gets treated. But moms and pretty much uh, it's like over half of all forceps deliveries result in that. Oh my God. Um, and so this levator anti avulsion, Andy, mm-hmm. I always I go back no and forth. Well, that's probably that gap you felt. And it's usually, yeah. I think that they said it's usually on the right side. Oh. Um, and so. It was on her right side. It was on the right side. There's a and gap. It was like it was like at seven o'clock. Yep. That's it. Yeah. Uh-huh. There's some, you can Google it, levator annie avulsions. Um, <coughs> yeah. so by the time she gave birth, we could hardly feel it. And then yeah. after birth. With therapy, it can get better. And then at six weeks, it was like, I can't find. And so she did mm-hmm. not, she got a, she got a weird first degree tear. Mm-hmm. That, um, like the only reason I had, I just repaired it because nothing late, like the skin was, yeah. it was like one of those things where if I don't repair it, You'll never it's look not gonna at it. heal right, yeah. But it's not gonna, yeah. And so, I just, you know, did that, and then at six weeks reassessed her bottom, and it was like, you never would have known what had happened before. I love when that happens. Yeah, You're yeah, like, and and we can so facilitate like that. The process itself. I feel like was part of the healing process, because I think a, I do actually think a really good birth, that um. Like I've had more than one pe- person come to me after a bad first first baby tear, like a third degree tear. Yeah. And we we go over a lot of things like how to soften the scar tissue, practice how to relax your perineum. Mm-hmm. And then if you can like, if she can accomplish that second birth gently, without rec- without another second degree tear, it's almost then like puts her back where she was before. Mm-hmm. I mean, it seems like it fixes it. So it's like. It's interesting what we think breaks us down can actually be part of the healing process. Mm, that is a good, that's good. That's a good statement to end on right there. What tears us down can actually heal us. Mm, Kim, so good. Kim, thank you. This has been very interesting getting to listen to the two of you geek out on this. <laughs> <laughs> I like these podcasts. They're always very informational for me. I um, appreciate your time today. It's yeah. super cool to hear some of these stories and to hear kind of you fighting the battle um, on the education side as well. Um, it's very cool. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for being on our show. Thanks yeah. Me. Real quick, real quick. Where can people find more information about you and find you? Well, I, I have a website. So I'm at Kim Osterholzer.com. Okay. And then, um, and then my book is actually um, on Amazon and Barnes and Nobles, and almost all the Barnes and Noble stores carry the book right now. It's so good. Everybody, go out and get it. We are going to list those uh, in yes. the show notes. And um, super cool. Thank you so much for yes. spending time with us today. Really appreciate it. Wait, wait, wait. What's your favorite exercise, Kim? Oh, I keep my forgetting favorite this. exercise of all time is is squatting. 
Because I feel Amen. like it's really like in squatting without touching anything, because then you've got the neural thing going on, and which I feel like it's probably Alzheimer's prevention too. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's like an all body exercise. As long as you're doing your squat properly, I feel like a poorly done squat is probably the one of the most destructive things you can do too. Sure. Ooh, good so point. Properly done squat. That's my favorite exercise. Awesome. I love it. I'm with you on that. Definitely. All right. Have a great day. I'm learning. Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you. Oh, for crying out loud in a bucket. It's really hard for me to end these podcasts. I could talk to our guests for days. Thanks for listening. I really hope you join our community over at fit2be.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Fit2Be, on Instagram at Fit2Be Studio, and on Facebook via Fit2Be Tummy Safe Fitness. See you soon.